good evening everyone uh, i would like to welcome you all to the fifth session of uh, this lecture series on structural design of uh, highway bridges and uh, as usual our uh, sincere gratitude to uh, professor tisan jaisingh for conducting these valuable uh, knowledge sharing sessions and uh, further uh, uh, i have a sp small notice for you all that uh, we have uh, arranged a cert participation certificate for all the participants so uh, that 80% uh, of attendance will be counted from today's lectures lecture onwards and those who uh, complete that will uh, ha have the uh, participation certificate so for recording purpose uh, i would like to ask you all to uh, uh, rename your name with the membership number as well other than your name you can add the membership number as well so then it is easy for uh, ESL to record the attendance and uh, yes over to you sir Good evening, Professor. So it's not audible. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Right. So, uh, Right. So today we'll uh, talk about a little more on uh, reinforced concrete bridges. And uh, so far I have explained the theory. And uh, last time I explained how uh, we can find the uh, reinforcement as for the Euro code as well. And I will uh, take photos and uh, send it to engineer Barnukka so that he can share all the uh, all my notes with you. Uh, the, so basically I have the notes with me, the last two sets of notes, but uh, uh, I have to take some photos and send it to you. So I'll do that uh, after the lecture. So, uh, so I'm now I'm going to uh, get the camera on. So, so first uh, we look at, uh, I'm going to share the screen. So this is the fifth lecture on our series. So far we have discussed uh, briefly about the loading that we had and uh, the HP loading and then uh, Euro specification and uh, the kind of uh, axles that you can place or single wheel loads and the abnormal loading uh, which can actually vary between 600 kilometers to 3600 kilometers or 60 tons to 360 tons earlier uh, it used to be uh, 120 100 tons to 180 tons now you can see uh, a bigger re range is given so uh, depending on the type of highway that we are using this type of bridges you have to make the decision and uh, then uh, we also looked at 
this particular concept where uh, we go with uh, precast members uh, with the idea of minimizing the weight of the bridge, minimizing the weight of the bridge. And uh, we said we can go with this kind of uh, precast sections. And these are the key score to ensure that it is it acts like continuous. Sorry, it locks in very well when you are doing this is in situ cast concrete, this is precast concrete. So, so basically the idea is uh, precast concrete uh, will adhere very well or lock into the uh, in situ cast concrete. And the, the shape of the bridge is like this. And then we have some guidelines that we have uh, uh, worked out by performing a number of designs. <clears throat> Right, so uh, we'll take one of these examples and see how a bridge can be uh, constructed. And then uh, to determine the amount of reinforcement, uh, again, uh, some charts have been developed. So today we see how we can make use of this type of information. And uh, so basically, uh, first, uh, without worrying too much about uh, the exact dimensions, we'll first look at the concept well. So the concept is, uh, if you are going to do a bridge, you are, and you are going to design it for Eurocodes. I'll stop share for a moment. And I'm going to get the other note on concrete design. Just give me one minute until I get the notes open. Sure. Right, so let's see uh, the power requirement. Okay, let's look at the concrete properties first. Now we have to make a decision. What is the strength of concrete? Now, so we have to make a decision. What's the strength of concrete? For that, uh, we have to see uh, where are we going to precast? Precast. Where are we going to perform the precasting operation? And here you can see cube strength, 45, 50 is there, and the corresponding uh, cylinder strength is 40. So cube strength is 50, F CU is 50, and uh, FCK is 40. So if you look at uh, some of the important properties, this is the mean strength. And this is the kind of uh, tensile strengths are here. And then the elastic modulus is about 35. Elastic modulus is about 35. And uh, you know, uh, the elongation, the, the maximum strain is 3.5. So basically 
whatever the equations that we tried last time will be applicable. Uh, so last time we learned the where the method that Europod uses. So I'm going to use the same method, but I'm now trying to tell you how we approach the problem as a structural engineer who is going to design a reinforced concrete uh, structure. And uh, so, so based on all this information, now we have to see what are the cover requirements. So for that, uh, I'm sure you are familiar with all these things now. Now we have to see what are the cover requirements. And uh, you can see now this is XC3 is for concrete inside buildings with moderate or high air humidity. Now this is XC3 is the one that we generally use in, uh, in uh, buildings. An external concrete sheltered from rain, this may be applicable uh, to uh, bridges. But on the other hand, we can go for XC4. Right? XC4 is more stringent. And if you are using XC4 and uh, design work in life 100 years, so increase the class by two. And here, C4050 reduce the class by one because we are using C4050. And uh, we are going to precast the members. So we, because when you are precasting, what is the difference between precasting and uh, normal uh, concreting operation, normal concreting operation, we are going to walk on the reinforcement. Whereas in the case of precasting, we are not going to do any of those things. So which means uh, we here, we it says increase the class by two. Here it says reduce the class by one and one. So which means we can use S4. And if you are using S4 for XC3, the cover requirement is 30 millimeters, 30 millimeters, okay? So the cover requirement is 30 millimeters, right? So let's see how this information can be used in a structural design. Let's see how this information can be used in a structural design. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Now let's see. Our cover requirement for S4 condition is 30. And what is applicable is also S4 because it says increase it by two because we are going to design a brick that is going to last 100 years. Then it says reduce by one, reduce by one. Right. So which means when we are casting, uh, we can actually, uh, so we we'll keep this in mind. Uh, we, we really don't know how we can use it so far. Now let's say we look at the arrangement that we are going to do. So basically, uh, uh, we'll have beams like this. So whether this is 300 or 350, you have to decide. And if you want, you can go up to 350. Uh, otherwise, 300 also might work. But uh, that all depends on... Uh, the the that all depends on the the weight of the beam that you are going to pass because you have to finally lift it up and place it. So you, you have to look at the capacity of the crane available for you. Now these days cranes are readily available, so we can assume that we are going to make use of a crane. Now, what is the most important parameter that we have decided? The most important parameter is, what is this X? At which spacing we are going to have at which spacing we are going to have At which basic we are going to have uh, these beams. So that's a, another one important parameter. And let's say we are going to have a depth of about 600 millimeters. Right? This is a typical case. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm trying to tell you how to think about it, right? So now 
Or we have to think about the loading. Let's say, you know, we are going to use DS5400 part one, part two loading of 1978. Because that's, a, because you know, I mean, we may not be doing this kind of bridge in a major highway, but it will be, I mean, we want a cost-effective bridge done. So, so we'll assume that, you know, this is going to be a normal road uh, and we are going to design a bridge to carry uh, a load, uh, which is uh, equal to 30 kilonewtons per meter per lane. Then we have to decide what is the width of the lane. And let's say we like to have 3.5 meters of lane. So I'm trying to tell you, you know, show you a typical problem and uh, how to think about it, right? So now we have to see. Uh, now one option is we can have the beams at 1.75 meters. So that will give us a chance to have the road over this area. And then that will allow us to have the pedestrian pavement. Uh, with the, We have to make sure that we can accommodate the handrail. We have to have a curbstone. And uh, we'll uh, end up with something like uh, 1.6 meters for the pedestrian pavement. And we can repeat the same thing on this side. Uh, this is one of the, these are reasonable arrangement, right? So, so let's say, you know, we are, we like this arrangement and we have decided to uh, go with this particular arrangement. That means X is going to be 1.75 meters, right? X is going to be 1.75 meters. So we can have another lane here, another pedestrian pavement. All together, 1.75 into 3 plus uh, multiplied by 2. So, <laughs> so the width is 1.75 into 6, approximately. So it's a 10.5 meter wide, wide bridge. So it's good to have some to you know pedestrian pavements on either side. Uh, so let's assume that we are going to have it because we are going to have a cost-effective solution. Then if you look at it, then we have to cast some panels. So the most important question is what is the thickness of the panel? What is the thickness of the panel? What is the thickness of the panel? So that is the most important question. So when you look at the thickness of the panel, we know we need 30 millimeter cover to the reinforcement. And we might need 12 or 16 millimeter bars. So let's assume that, you know, we are going to get another 10 millimeter, just to get some idea about the thickness of the panel. And uh, so, so let's assume that we are going to end up with something like this. And uh, then we have, now here it's 40 millimeters. So if it is 40, uh, we have to make sure that at least, you know, 90 to 100 millimeters is used for as the thickness of the panel. 90 to 100 millimeter has to be used for as the thickness of the panel. So let's assume that we are going to use 90 millimeters. So it's going to be 90 millimeters. And I'm going to have a cover of 30. 
and let's assume we can we can go up to 20 millimeters we might not need 20 millimeters but let's assume that we are going up to that so this is distance to the centroid is 40 and here you get rather 50 millimeters right now you can ask a question uh, in eurocode Whatever the cover given by these uh, guidelines that I have shown you, they say there should be a rather additional cover of 10 millimeter to allow for construction on this. Now, if you are not, if you are going to precast. The question is, do we have to consider these construction tolerances? Answer is no. Because we are keeping a cover of 30 and we, by using cover blocks of 30 millimeter, we can assure that this cover remains 30 and we are not going to uh, do anything that will change the cover. So because of that reason, we don't have to use this 10 millimeter construction tolerance. But if you want, you can use five millimeters. Why? Because uh, no, when you're casting, you might use a polythene sheet and it might uh, have uh, few wrinkles and, you know, because of all these minor variations. If you want, you can allow about five millimeter and uh, that's all you have to allow. So, so basically, instead of uh, 30 millimeters, if you want, you can go for 35 millimeters. On the other hand, if you are going to cast on steel shutters with proper cover blocks, then you can go for 30 millimeter, right? So that's how you have to look at it. So the, I'm talking about the practical aspects, right? Of working out the dimensions. So once you do that, <coughs> so we are going to get these beams at 1.75 meters spacing. And then the next question you have is, what is the bearing you are going to have? What is the bearing? That means how much you need here. So minimum is 40 and you can go up to 50 millimeters. So if you are going to have 50 here and 50 here, then if this is 300, you are going to end up with 200 spacing here. That looks reasonable. That looks reasonable. Right, so, so you can see, why we need to one 300 millimeter instead of 150? The reason is we have to make sure these uh, precast members are kept. But the most important thing about these precast members is make sure when you are precasting, the reinforcement continues from this to this end to end. Re reinforcement continues from end to end. So, so don't have a situation where the reinforcement stops halfway through. So you cannot have a situation where, now these are the details that are important. Don't have a situation like that. That will That is detrimental because we are, we are not having uh, the con reinforcement continuous over to the beam. So you must make sure the reinforcement is continuous. Now, this is 90 millimeters. And we are going to complete the bridge with an overall thickness of 180 to 200 millimeters. So it can, this can be another 90 or it can go up to 100 as well. That is your preference. But uh, you have to again look at how we, how, on what basis we get these dimensions. Because uh, here, now we are going to have two types of links here. Two types of links. This is one link. And uh, when you are casting, you can even have another link like this. You can have two links. And the idea of this link is it should go up and we have to have 30 millimeter cover at this end. 
we have to ensure 30 millimeter cover at this end because uh, we can easily ensure 30 millimeter right so if you want you can go for 35 millimeter there also and uh, this particular link can be 8 millimeter right 8 millimeter that is to carry shear and uh, so in addition to that we have to assure that we can place a reinforcement like that right so when you consider all that let's work out the dimensions by with an enlarged diagram so here you get uh, this uh, green color line green color line and then you get a 30 millimeter cover and a reinforcement goes like this and then there's a, at least a 12 millimeter reinforcement and you might have something like another 12 millimeter reinforcement uh, continue 12 millimeter continue so here you get 30 plus 8 plus 12 plus 12 so get 24 38 plus 24 62 millimeters so it looks so 62 so if you are going to lay 90 so the bottom of this reinforcement uh, we will have 62 so we can see if you are going for 90 or above, it may be okay. So, which means you can have a, a diameter of you can have a diameter of uh, so you can have a thickness of overall thickness of 180 to 200, provided the precast panel is 90 millimeters. So this is how you will work out the details for the bridge. It's very important we get the details accurate. And uh, today is 21st, 3, 20, 23, 1, 2, right. right. So yeah, it's very important we get these the details very carefully uh, sorted out because before you start the structural design, we must work out this, okay? Now, once you work out these details, you can look at the guidelines that are given. So now let's look at the guidelines. So let's look at the guidelines given. So the guideline is, uh, let's say we are going for a 12 meter span, 12 meter span. So that is a 40 feet bridge. Not a small bridge, we are going for 12 meter span. We are going for 12 meter spans. And uh, the size will be, uh, size of the beam will be 650 by 300, 650 by 300. The guideline given is 650 by 300. And uh, we are going to use it. 650 by 300. And we are going to use it at 1.75 meter interval. And um, so we are going to have 50 millimeter bearing here. Here we are going to have 50. And we are going to have overall of 180. And these are cast at 90. Right. So, so you can see. I'll share the screen.
Right, so you can see a uh, 412 meter span, the size of the beam is 650 millimeters by 300, right? 650 by 300. And uh, so I'll stop here. So you can see 650 by 300 and uh, 1.75 meters spacing, right? And uh, this will be loaded privately by HA loading, right? Which means uh, HA loading will be something like 30 divided by 3.5 equals eight point five seven kilonewtons per meter square. Eight point five seven kilonewtons per meter square. So once you work out those details, then uh, what are the components that you are going to design? Number one, we are going to Design this beam, this lab, precast lab. And what is the load? The load is the weight of concrete that you are going to place, and that is 90 millimeters thick concrete. And we have to think about the width of this member. So if you look at the width of the member, we prefer a width of 450 millimeters. You will ask why. Again, the answer is, we are going to have three reinforcement and we are going to maintain the distance of 150 millimeters. And then we are going to place the other panel next to it. There also we can have this. So if this 450, here you get 75. On this side also you get 75. So similarly here you get 75. So which means it's like H12 at 150. So that's why you prefer this 450 millimeter width because uh, by when you place the reinforcement, you can place the reinforcement at 150 center to center. But uh, depending on the reinforcement requirement, you can change the diameter. You can change the diameter. Again, you will ask why 150. No, if you look at uh, bridges, big engineers have been very comfortable with this 150 millimeter spacing for bridge decks. So uh, it's something that they have developed traditionally. The reason is uh, they actually look at the, uh, the crack, possibility for cracking. In reinforced concrete, the easiest way to minimize cracking is use small diameter bars, but a large number of small diameter bars than using small number of large diameter bars. So, so they like uh, using small diameter bars like 12 millimeter at 150 to using 16 millimeter bars at 200. They prefer, they prefer using small diameter bars at close space. That's the reason. So that's something that, uh, you know, with experience, they have, they have noticed. When you are using small diameter bars, then you can actually uh, improve uh, the performance because the chances for cracking would be minimal. So in that case, now this particular beam having a width of 0. Uh, 45 meters. This is the load, and you have to multiply that load uh, by 1.2 multiplied by 1.1. These, these are the uh, factor of safety, gamma F, and this is called gamma F3. So there are two factors of safety. And uh, 
I'm just talking about the BS loads. Right. Later, later day, we, I will explain the Euro code loads. But uh, just to because now, now today's aim is to make you understand the design philosophy for reinforced concrete. So I do not want to complicate it by introducing a new loading system. So basically, the idea is uh, this uh, BS five four zero zero part two 1978 loading system is very simple, very easy to understand. So basically, uh, we have to make sure. Uh, that uh, this uh, top slab can be cast without without uh, needing any props without needing any props because some in a bridge you know it's difficult to provide a prop in the middle difficult so this is difficult so we are not going to provide a prop in the middle so with this you can find the loading intensity which is 0 0.09 is because of the 90 millimeter thickness Multiplied by 0.45, that is the width. Multiplied by 25, will give you something like uh, one kilonewton per meter. Multiplied by 1.2, multiplied by 1.1, so that gives about uh, 1.33 kilonewtons per meter. So you can see it's a very small moment. And you can design it for bending moment is equal to W L squared by 8, which is given by 1.33 into. Uh, we just assume that you know the span is about 1.6 meters, because here you can see the center to center is 1.75. So we we'll say the span is 1.6 squared divided by 8. And that gives a very small moment, 1.33 into 1.6 squared divided by 8. And uh, 4256, mainly moment. And then, uh, you know, you can find the reinforcement. And let's say that is AS1. AS1. Now, what is the situation? So when you cast this, the slab will become continuous like this. And now we are going to apply the live load moments. And due to those live load moments also, you are going to get another bending moment. And for that, you can find the reinforcement AS2. So when you are providing, ensure that what is provided with AS1 and AS2, AS1 for dead or plus sulfate. So actually I have to consider the dead weight as well, sulfate also. So basically uh, this will be doubled. So it should be uh, not 3.66 because uh, this has to carry the self weight of the uh, beam as well. So altogether it's 2.66. So it will be 8.4. Uh, so here I consider only the weight of concrete, but the self weight is also there. So we have to consider both. So when you consider both, this will be, should be multiplied by 2. And uh, so you get 2.6. So this is dead plus self weight of concrete plus AS2 is what you get, what you need to uh, resist the, the bending moment in a continuous beam. So for the live loads, it is continuous. And you are applying a load equivalent to 8.57, uh, 8 8.57 kilonewtons per meter squared, equivalent. These are the load, but equivalent, right? Okay. So, so for the for the for AS2, it is continuous. And AS1, 
it is simply supported. So that's the difference. So if it is continuous for AS2, then you have to make sure we have this situation and uh, we have this uh, reinforcement. And this particular reinforcement is also provided. So here you get AS2 and here you get AS1 plus AS2. So whatever you get here, you can provide here as well. Why? Because uh, there's a Hoggy moment. So you can actually calculate the Hoggy moment and I say AS3, right? But AS3 will be pretty similar to AS2. And then, so you get this coming here. This is the other additional reinforcement provided that way. So, so you have to provide all these reinforcements. Why? For lie loads, top slab could be continuous. You cannot say that it is perfectly continuous because uh, you know these pre RC beam is also going to deflect a little bit. So because of that, it's not a perfect continuous situation, but we assume a perfect continuous situation and we provide the reinforcement. So because we, we have a little bit of uncertainty, what is your, what is the method? So you know here and here. Here we get AS1 plus AS2 and be little generous here. In the span. Here you can get what it says. Is that clear? Why we are little, going to be little generous here is we know beams are supporting the slab and beams are also deflecting a little bit. Because of that reason, if the support settle, then uh, you can't make get the full effect of the support. So because of that reason, we will be little generous in the span. Whereas we can be strict with the support. So that is something that you have to be keep in mind uh, when you are deciding the final reinforcement. Because there's only one way this slab bridge can fail. Where is it? It is at this. In this section, it can fail. And that failure occurs due to second moment. So the best way to resist. Sagging is be little generous with this particular effect. So that's something you can keep in mind. Right? So if you need uh, only 10 millimeter, you will provide 12 millimeter. If you need 12 millimeter, you might consider providing uh, something like uh, at least a 16 millimeter bar in the middle. So here we are getting this situation. So the middle bar can be you need only 12 millimeter, but middle bar you might try 16 millimeter. And these can be 12 millimeter. So in that way, you are providing little extra reinforcement than the minimum you need. So that way, uh, these, uh, this will be very uh, robust. But again, you have another problem. What is that? That is, you know, when you are designing the truck slab, you have to design it for a more rigorous situation. That is a 10 kilonewton, 100 kilonewton point load acting at the center. Point load acting at the center. So after designing for all those live loads, there's a UDL. Now you have to check for this particular situation. Check for this particular situation. 
Now we have a problem because we are having panels like this. Each panel is 450, 450, 450. Now we are going to have a patch load. And what is the area of the patch? The load is 100 kilonewtons. The stress has to be 1.1 newtons per milliliter squared. So, uh, force divided by area is equal to stress. That means area is equal to force is 100 into 10 to the power 3 newtons divided by stress 1.1. And, and once you take the, so what you get is 100, 100 to the power 3 divided by 1.1. So 90,909 millimeter squared. And take the square root of that area. So you can see the contact area of the load is 301 millimeter by 301. So it will need a contact area of 301 millimeter by 301. So you are going to get a patch load here. Now you have a problem because there are this 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 huge load is going to act on one panel, one precast panel. So what you do is uh, we have done some uh, load sharing uh, because we are going to have a speed concrete, and this concrete is there. So whatever the load will be distributed, though these panels are separate, the loads will be distributed. So we say this panel carry 40% of the load, this every 30%. So although you have to design for a 100 kilonewton load, you will design it only for a 40 kilonewton, 40% 40 of the load or 40 kilonewton load acting at the center. It's very important. Otherwise, if you try to design for 100 kilonewton, you will find you need enormous amount of reinforcement in the, in the top frame. So you have to always think how much load distribution could take place uh, because we are going to have a number of panels side by side. And uh, so we have done testing. We have looked at the load uh, distribution. There are research papers published on engineer journal for this type of testing, covering this type of testing for precast panels. So uh, our conclusion was, uh, you know, directly under the load, you can say 40% of the load is carried by the panel directly under the load and uh, remaining uh, two panels will carry 30% each. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Right? Right. So that's so, so basically we assume that uh, it can polish. Uh, so because these are important things because you know when you are designing the top slab, there are two conditions that you have to meet. One is you have to make sure all the uh, uh, you know UDS can be carried by the top slab. In addition to that, you have to make sure if there's a very heavy wheel load of 100 kilonewton acting on a slab that is 10 tons, then that load could be taken by the panels or the reinforcement in the uh, deck is sufficient to ensure that this type of heavy load will not uh, will not cause the failure of the bridge. Right? And again, when you are looking at this uh, 100 kilometers, because we are checking it for ultimate limit state, you have to always apply the uh, factors of safety for, uh, uh, for uh, live load. And the factor of safety for live load in BS was 1.5 and 1.1. So 1.5 multiplied by 1.1 is 1.6. So you have to apply a factor of safety of 1.65 for whatever the load. But the most important thing is we are going to design it for only 40% of the total point load that we are going to apply on the slabs. 
so this way you can determine the reinforcement in the top slab considering two different scenarios first scenario is that you know it's subjected to the normal udl but the second scenario is it's subjected to a point right and uh, there's some other load for knife edge load that will act simultaneously so that it also has to be considered so basically uh, first consider the live load scenario due to uh, designing it for ha loading and uh, the chances that you if you want you can check it for a uh, 100 ton vehicle uh, that is you know hb vehicle uh, so so basically in addition to that you can consider that this bridge will be subjected to uh, 25 tons of uh, 25 units of hp hb b type loading and giving a total weight of 100 tons in vehicle with uh, four axles at 1.8 meter spacing and this length can vary between 6 meters and so on so it will be 6 meters in this particular case and uh, so you will end up with something like that and each uh, axle will carry 25 tons that means each wheel will carry 6.25 tons each wheel so the moment you look at the wheel load now you know these 62.5 kilonewtons. If you have already designed the truck slab for carrying 100 kilonewtons, 100 kilonewtons, then you might find that you know this 62.5 can be easily carried. So 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 when you design 400 ton, uh, so 10 ton wheel load then the other loads will be generally okay. So this way we can make sure that uh, the top strap is having a thickness of 180 millimeters, going up to 200 millimeters, depending on the kind of control you have. Uh, so you can actually make sure that uh, we have these beams at 1.75 and the depth of the beam is 650. Depth of the precast beam is 650. And for 12 meters, we are going to get an overall thickness of about 830 to 850 millimeters. Right? 850 millimeters. And you can see it's not a small bridge. We are talking about 12 meters, which is equivalent to 40 feet span. And a stream having a width of 40 feet is a reasonably wide. Uh, bridge reasonably wide stream so so you can see we are going to have a bridge of reasonable length not a very small bridge so once you decide all those things then uh, we have to consider a situation for the beams so again we have two situations so please civil section Number six. Again, you have two situations. One is we are going to place, we have the beam. We have another beam. And we are going to place this. And we are going to place this concrete. So these 180 millimeters. And the weight is 0.18 into 0 0.45, 0 0.18 into uh, 1 meter length into 25 into 1.2 into 1.1. So you get 0.18 into 1 into 25. Mm -hmm. 
0.18 plus 1 meter length and uh, sorry, multiplied by 1.75 meters. So this way you get 1.75 meters. 1.75 into 0.18 into 1 multiplied by 25 multiplied by 1.2 multiplied by 1.4 so you are going to get a beam simply supported at 12 meter span and carrying a load of 10.395 plus self weight. So let's assume that all that comes to 11 kilonewtons per meter. So WL squared of 8 is equal to 11 into 12 squared divided by 8. That is 11 into 12 squared divided by 8. 198 kilonewtons. So it has to be designed to carry 198 kilonewton meters uh, for a 600 millimeter deep beam. Uh, it's not a major moment because last time we took an example of 600 by 300 beam as far as I can remember. And uh, we ended up uh, with a reinforcement. So for example, if I tell you the kind of reinforcement you need, uh, it's about so what you need is about uh, one thousand fifty three millimeters so I'm just done an approximate calculation so so you can see now you have a 600 millimeter deep beam 650 millimeter deep beam 300 wide and uh, you will need about uh, 1000 uh, 100 1100 1200 millimeter squared or 4H20. 4H20. You need something like 4H20. Now, that is to ensure that this particular beam can carry uh, the, the weight of uh, the deck before any composite action comes into. Play before any composite action comes into play. right. So that's uh, that's something that you have to first we can identify. So we can say again the first situation the reinforcement. Now we have to see how this bridge is going to behave when it is subjected to uh, alignments. How it's going to behave when it's subjected to alignments, right? So. When subjected live loads, what happens? Now this bridge, the whole structure is effective. So this will behave primarily as a flange beam. And this is 650. This is 180. And all this flange is going to go into Compression. So this flange area will be in compression. So we'll have a flange beam having a shape like this. These 90 millimeters. And the width, the maximum width is 1.75 meters. There are some guidelines on the maximum width that you can use. But uh, the maximum width is 1.675, but it could be slightly lower than that as well if you look at the shear lag effects. And then uh, here you get 650. And the overall depth is uh, 8, 730, 
Now the live nodes are going to act on it. And if I approximate take the live load on that with a magnitude of 8.57 kilonewtons per meter squared, right? So the beam will now be subjected to 1.75 into 8.57 multiplied by uh, one point two in one point five into one point one. These are approximate values, but use a good good approximation. So you get one point seven five multiplied by eight point five seven multiplied by one point five multiplied by one point one. So you get twenty four point seven four kilonewtons per meter. Now you can compare these two. Compare these two because uh, earlier we have already considered the weight due to uh, the weight of the panels plus beam as 11 kilonewtons per meter. Now you can say, see, we can we are designing it for a live load of 24.74 kilonewtons per meter, right? And then you can see if you take uh, now, again, this beam is going to behave as simply supported W squared over 8 is equal to 24.74 into uh, 12 squared divided by 8. And the answer is 24.74 multiplied by 144 divided by 8. So, 445 kilonewton meters. So, you can see, uh, because, you know, every 1.75 meters, we are going to have a, a beam. So, the B load carried by a beam is whatever the live load that acts over 1.75 meters, right? So now we are going to get about 445 kilonewton meters, but we have an advantageous position now because we are having a beam of 830 millimeters of depth. And above all, we are going to get a width of 1750 millimeters. And so effective depth of uh, something like, uh, let's say, uh, 760, because uh, here again you have to understand that you know we we cannot provide we have, might have to provide an additional layer of reinforcement, so it will be like that. So because of that, I'm going to consider D as something like 760 millimeters, right? So I have because I have just, just kept some space, or I'll, I'll use a D of 750 millimeters. And this is going to be 90 millimeters. Now we have to see, now we know the moment, so I'm going to uh, make use of the equation for uh, calculating the, uh, so first we can uh, calculate K is equal to M over F C K B D squared. And that is 445 into the power 6 divided by FCK is uh, 40 multiplied by breadth uh, 1750 multiplied by 750 squared. And we are going to end up with. One hundred forty-five to the power six divided by four divided by one seven fifty divided by seven hundred fifty. So you get zero point zero one one three less than point one six seven.
so which means we can singly reinforce the beam and uh, so singly reinforced beam we said is equal to d 0.5 plus 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 square root of 0.25 minus uh, k over 1.134. So Z is given by this equation. So the value of Z Z is equal to d 0.5 plus square root of 0.25 minus k over 1.134 and that is uh, 750 multiplied by d multiplied by 0.5 plus square root of 0.25 minus 0.0113 divided by 1.134 and the answer is Point not one one three divided by one point one three four minus point two five point two five minus point zero one one three divided by one point one three four square root plus 0.5. So he said this is equal to 0.95 d. And from this, m is equal to 0.87 fy as multiplied by z. So the bending moment is 445 into the number 6 is equal to 0.87 fy 500. Multiplied by AS multiplied by 0 0.95 into 750. From this one, you can find the value of AS that is 445 to the power 6 divided by 0 0.87 divided by 500 divided by 0 0.95 divided by 750, and you will get uh, 1435, which means. Uh, you will need something like uh, three three of h twenty five giving four hundred ninety to three one thousand four hundred seventy right. So now you can see now we are going to have the beam three hundred wide. 600 deep, 650 deep, having links like that, and one bottom layer of, or we can even change it, uh, four numbers of H25 plus three numbers of H20. So I just change it. Uh, instead of uh, three numbers, uh, four numbers of H20 and uh, three numbers of H25, I have provided four at the bottom and I can provide three bars here. So that's the kind of reinforcement you let up. So this way you can actually uh, provide the reinforcement. And you can see this is a significant savings in the reinforcement because you need a lot of reinforcement only in this particular beam to carry the loads. So the actual, uh, because I have ignored some of the loads, so the chances are you might end up with 8H20. If you, if you are considered all the loads, accurately because I have ignored some of the knife edge loads and so on. So if you have considered all the loads, you might end up with something like 8H25 in the beam. So if you look at the situation is that you will have a bridge having 
a precast beam of 650 wide, 300 deep. And if you look at the weight of the precast beam, it's going to be 0.65 into 0.3 into 25. So it's about uh, 5 kilonewtons per meter weight. The weight of the beam will be about 5 kilonewtons per meter. Weight of the beam will be about 5 kilonewtons per meter. Right. And uh, so that means 5 into 12 is 60 kilonewtons or 6 tons. So if you are going to lift the beam, you need a train of six tons. So if you can hire a 10 ton train, then you should be able to manage it. And then we are going to have this and the reinforcement will be like this. And uh, this will be something like Eight H twenty five. Then uh, you might need links, but uh, when it comes to links, you are going to look at the shear force, and you can see uh, that the total weight, total shear will be due to uh, two 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 different loads, two different loads, and one load is like uh, one load is about twelve kilonewtons per meter, so I think uh, it will be about. 11 plus the self weight, so it may be about uh, 10.395 plus self weight of 5 kilonewtons per meter, so which is about 15.395 plus the other weight is uh, the live load, and live load we calculated it as something like 20. 4.5, 24.75 kilonewtons per meter, right? So the total total will be uh, 24.75 plus 15.395. So the total is about 40 kilonewtons per. So now the sheet, so we have a beam, 12 meters, 12 meters of length and subjected to a load of 40 kilometers per meter. And uh, so the shear force is going to be 0.5 times 40 uh, multiplied by 12 or WL over two, which gives 0.5 multiplied by 40 multiplied by 12, something like 240 kilo newtons. And uh, that is, this page is, By six. Uh, the seven and eight. Sectional committee seven. Civil engineering sectional committee eight. And uh, here you get civil engineering sectional committee nine. Civil engineering section. Nine. And here we go. Right. Now you can see the shear force is about 240 
kilonewtons and uh, we have a precast beam of 650 by 352 carried because we might not uh, consider this part because we are going to cast it in two different two separate uh, operations so we it will be conservative for us to consider that only the precast beam will carry all the shear force so if you look at simple b that is shear stress that is 240 into 10 to the power 3 divided by uh, 600 divided by 350 uh, simple v is equal to capital b over bd and if you look at this particular value you get 240 to the power 3 divided by 600 divided by 350 and the answer is 1.14 Simple V is 1.14, and you will find it's not a very significant shear stress. So it's a shear stress is very low. And that is the beauty of this method. Why? Because we are reducing the self weight as much as possible. We cannot do anything about lime. But what we do is we select sufficient number of beams at a reasonable spacing like 1.75. So each beam will carry only half the, the lane load. So this way we are keeping the weight of the bridge low and the B each beam is carrying only half the live load per lane. So that way we are actually keeping the, the shear sufficiently low and flexure is also sufficiently low. So the, the biggest advantage of this system is this one. self weight is kept as low as possible. And in doing so, we are optimizing the structure to the level that it becomes it becomes uh, fairly economical because uh, we have removed a huge penalty associated with self aid. Self aid is a huge penalty. And what we have done is by going for discrete beams with a thin slab, with discrete beams with a thin slab, we have. Uh, minimize the amount of uh, material in it. So the self weight becomes as low as possible. We cannot do anything about the live load because it has already been specified. So because of this reason, we'll end up with a fairly strong bridge, but the weight is as low as possible. So that is the philosophy behind this very cost effective Precast reinforced concrete uh, beam slab bridge. Right? So I have done some calculations, not all the calculations. I have shown you how the reinforcement can be calculated. And then I showed that the shear stress is also sufficiently low. So uh, most of, mostly you will find it's eight links at 100 center to center would be sufficient uh, at the, in the, close to the support, right? So the chances are you will find that uh, H8 at 100 center to center would be very, very quite sufficient. And you can relax it to H8 at 150 center to center. Just do the calculation. And because with my experience, I'm telling you, that you know when you when you have v as uh, one point uh, one four, uh, this particular detail works. Uh, H eight at hundred centimeter is quite sufficient, and then uh, as you go beyond uh, to the other center, you can relax it to H eight at hundred fifty. So this way we can actually uh, reduce uh, the amount of steel involved drastically. And because we are removing a lot of concrete from the structure, so we need uh, less concrete. 
so otherwise we would have we had we would have gone for about 700 millimeters of thickness now we have reduced it to about 180 and once in a while we get a beam so so you might get about 50 percent reduction in concrete weight and the moment you do that you get a because the now the loads are low, then the steel requirement is also go down, and we don't need foam work because we are going to precast all these. Only thing that we need is to hire a crane. Hire a crane. That's all. And then uh, we also have to think about H C uh, forty fifty concrete. And how you get C4050 concrete is by using about 450 kilograms of cementitious material. Can I explain this method? And uh, so you can go for about uh, 350 kilograms of cement and about uh, 100 kilograms of uh, or 80 kilo, 260 about 270 and uh, 80 kilograms of flyers. So what is the reason? The reason is, you know, you get very high degree of durability. The moment you introduce fly ash, so if you look at the concrete mix for this particular bridge of C40, 50, uh, so we, we say uh, cement is uh, 450, consisting of 370 cement and uh, about uh, 80 kilograms of fly ash. And uh, then we get sand, aggregate, water, and wet density of about 2,470. Because, because we are using fly ash, the wet density will drop and the water content will go for about 160. And the moment you do all that, you get 2470 minus 160 minus 450, 1860 divided by 2.7. You will go for about 700 sand. And 1160 aggregates. And out of this, you will go for about uh, 150 quarry dust and about uh, 550 manufactured sand. And here you will go, go for about 160. chips and 500, 10 millimeter and 500, 20 millimeter. On the other hand, you can go for uh, 20, 80 here and 20, 40, 40 here. So it's all up to you, you decide on the values. And uh, so to ensure that you go for way, uh, proper way batching, we can prepare separate way boxes for each item. And uh, that way we can convert uh, the, we use a density of 1.6 for uh, 1.6, specific gravity of 1.6 for sand, 1.7 for aggregate, and 1.44 cement and 1.04 water. So that way you can work out. The, the, these are the density. So density of cement is about 1,400 kilograms per meter cube. And uh, sand will be about 1,600 kilograms per meter cube. And this will be about uh, 1,700 kilograms per meter cube. So based on that, you can work out the volume of each item, and then you can ensure that uh, we go for a uh, curve.
السيفل انترسكشن So we go for a curve like this. Strength curve. So this is 40. This is 40. And we go for a curve like this. And we might actually say we need 40 megapascal cube strength. at 28 days. Why? Because we have used flying ash, we know with the time it will be 50 megapascal. So that way you can easily achieve a target. Otherwise, when you try to achieve 50 in 28 days, it may be hard, but uh, we set a lower target of 40. Why? Because we are using uh, about 15% flying ash, what happens? The strength development curve will go on. So, so by the time you complete the bridge, it would be of sufficient strength. And uh, so basically you have to precast the beads early. And, uh, and you also know, uh, as far as the reinforcement is concerned, there isn't a huge difference between uh, 40 megapascal and 50 megapascal when it is singly reinforced. But why we go for 50 megapascal is for durability. So by using fly ash with a later age, we can go for durability. Whereas at 28 days, even 40 megapascal is enough. Why? The reason is we know for sure for singly reinforced flange beams, the grade of concrete is not that important. If it is in 30 megapascal or above, even 40 megapascal, 50 megapascal, you are going to end up with the same mass. So you can do the calculations and see, that is my, with my experience, I know. If the bending moments are not very significant, like in our case, then, the concrete strength is also not important if, as far well, as long as you have 30 megapascal minimum. The reinforcement is not going to change drastically. So those are my experiences. So based on that, uh, you know, because always you have to do calculations and work out your own rules so that just by looking at the numbers, you can say whether the num you know, what are the, what are the important things about those numbers? So for example, uh, we, we designed this flange beam for something like 445 kilonewton meters. And if you look at uh, MOB, BD, MOBD squared for this particular moment, you are going to end up with 445 to the power 6 divided by, uh, we said 750 divided, divided by 750 divided by 3 are 1750. This point. It's a very small value. So because of that reason, you know, it has a huge capacity because this beam is going to behave as a flange beam for live loads. So because when you look at this number, you know, uh, strength of concrete is not important when you are deciding the amount of reinforcement. It's going to be the same amount, right? So, so likewise, you know, because uh, I explained the full process involved. And I did few calculations to show you how the reinforcement can be calculated as well. And I also gave some guidelines on uh, how to design for various live load situations, especially the point load that you get, and uh, also how to select the power condition. So basically, we looked at the, the basic numbers for its, the spacing. Then we looked at the cover requirement. And then we looked at uh, the thickness of the top flange. And after that, we looked at, uh, you know, how we are going to arrange the reinforcement in each beam. And based on all that, we first did understood how to calculate the reinforcement requirement in precast slabs. And then uh, we also looked at uh, the type of loading 
especially this point load of 100 kilonewtons, which might govern the uh, top slab design. And uh, then we looked at the beam and uh, we said beam is going to be uh, uh, again loaded in two stages. For each stage, we calculate the reinforcement separately and add it up. <coughs> and then I showed you the shear is not very critical and we can make the assumption she is going to be taken by only by the precast section. And then I showed you how uh, the, the grade of outfit can be looked at and then why it's important to uh, ensure the durability at a later stage a strength while worrying only about the 28 day strength for strength uh, for the concrete strength when calculating the reinforcement, and I showed you that it is not actually governed by the strength of concrete. So it, as well, as long as you have something about 30 megapascal, it's going to work. So that's the kind of, uh, you know, the practical approach of designing a very cost-effective bridge by using high strength reinforced concrete. So concrete is going to be high strength concrete, like 50 megapascal or more, uh, we try. And uh, we are going to use 500 megapascal reinforcement, but minimum amount of reinforcement, minimum amount of concrete, and doing so, a very lightweight bridge, but strong enough to carry HA and even HP, 25 units of loading. And if you want a little higher loading, like 180 kilonewton HP loading, uh, you might need a little more reinforcement. So with that, uh, I can come to the end. And if you have any questions, I can ask. Any questions? Uh, yes, uh, there, uh, at the very beginning, uh, there was a question. Uh, what is the basis for choosing 1.75 meter as the beam spacing? So actually, uh, I wanted to use uh, 3.5 meter wide uh, lanes for the vehicles. Because if you look at the type of vehicle that we use in our roads, our buses are 2.4 meters wide. Cars are 1.6 meters wide. So, so the dominating vehicle is bus. So if the bus is 2.4 meters wide, if you have only three meter lanes, then the lane, lane is too, too, too narrow. So it's, a go, it's, it's better to go for 3.5 meter wide lanes. So if you are going to have 3.5 meter wide lanes, it's better to have this uh, beam spaced at 1.75 meter. Is that clear? Yes. And right? There was another question. Uh, could yeah. you please recommend a book to refer on structural design of highway bridges under BS codes? Yeah, under BS codes. Mm. Actually, uh, you know, uh, our clock, the book by Clark, uh, L.A. Clark, BS 5400 by L.A. Clark, right? L.A. Clark. It's a very famous book. It explains how BS 5400 has been derived. It's a fantastic book. It covers, it gives a lot of uh, examples as well. One of the top, you know, one of the best books ever written. Clark is a very well known uh, uh, researcher who was associated with bridges. He has, he has developed so many things in uh, bridges. So, yes, he had in depth knowledge. And in his book, he has explained A to Z of uh, how BS codes are derived. It's the best book. Okay. So, uh, uh, for, uh, for PT, I, I'm going to start next week. Right, so today is only RC. Yeah, oh, you are talking about interface. Sir. Somebody is talking about interface here. It's, it's, a, it's a valid question, but you can see we are providing these links at very close space. Uh, interface here, you know, you can see here. We are having all these links at very close spacing. So we are having double links, uh, this link and this link. 
and we are going to provide these links around uh, 100 um, uh, sorry uh, 100 to 150 millimeter spacing and the moment you do that you find this interface here is uh, very well looked after very well looked after right here you get uh, you know here you get a weak plane and the idea is you know you need a reinforcement to uh, resist that particular interface here and uh, so for this type of loading because the because we are reducing the total bending moments interface shear also becomes small. Is that clear? Because interface shear is applicable only for the live loads, not for the dead loads. Dead loads are not taken using interface shear. Interface shear is applicable only for live loads. So that's why we are actually extending this particular link. All right. I think, uh, but, but you have to check it. There's no question, right? So fatigue is not a major problem when it comes to uh, um, uh, concrete uh, fatigue will be a problem only for steel used to local analysis of bridge particularly uh, right so somebody has asked uh, you know how to analyze the uh, slab for 100 kilonewton point load you can certainly use uh, a finite element but uh, because we are casting the slab in two stages, we have done the load testing and found the ratios that you have to use for load sharing. Because it has to, it, finite element can't handle that problem. The reason is if you have a thick slab, 200 or 180, cast in one operation, finite element works fine. But in our situation, we have a uh, deck slab that is cast in two, two, two separate operations. So because of that reason, we have actually done load testing and worked out the reasonable values for load share. Right. So any other question? It seems that's all, sir. That's all, right? Okay. And right. I, I would like to uh, invite yeah. Engineer Bashita to do the word of thanks. I'll be sending the Rashid. I'll send all the all the photos of the notes tomorrow. Uh -huh. right? Yes, sir. The okay, several have you. asked about the notes also. Yeah, yeah. So I'll be sending that, right? Okay. okay because I, I have carefully numbered all the pages, so I'll send all the notes uh, by tomorrow morning. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you, sir. Yes, Rashid. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Banduka. Dear attendees, I would like to extend a warm word of thanks to everyone who made this webinar on the structural design of highway bridges possible. Uh, we are grateful to CAC for organizing this inf informative session and to the esteemed speaker, Professor Jai Singer, for sharing his valuable insights. I would also like to express my uh, sincere gratitude to engineer Kamala Gunawardhana, the chairperson of CESC, for her support and encouragement. Our thanks also go out to the ISL Secretariat, Publicity Department, and IT team for their efforts in promoting and hosting, the, hosting uh, this event. Finally, we are excited to announce that the next session of this webinar series will be held on next Tuesday. We hope to see you all there for another enlightening and informative session. Thank you all once again for your participation and support. Thank you. Yeah, can, you also, can I also add a small thing? Uh, that is um, this coming Thursday, that is 23rd, uh, we are going to have another uh, discussion on uh, related to a uh, light uh, rail transit project uh, where we are going to talk about uh, you know mainly the application of bureau codes for improving the designs to end up with a slightly lower cost for the uh, the the you know bridges and elevated sections of the LRT project. Uh, so, because it's most likely that this project is going to happen soon and there may be room for further improvement to the structural designs that have already been completed. Uh, the reason is uh, already completed ones have been done according to BS5400. Whereas, if we decide to go for Euro codes with higher strength materials, and also if we start decide to use latest filing techniques and all that, uh, there is a significant uh, possibility for uh, improving uh, the designs and you know reducing the cost 
So uh, we are going to have a panel discussion on this particular topic on uh, Thursday, uh, that is 23rd uh, at IESL. Moderator is uh, Dr. Devasurendra, who was, is a mechanical engineer, and uh, Professor Ranjit Sanayaka will also participate. So we are going to uh, talk about various options that are available for us to consider and we'll come up with some, uh, you know, presentations on uh, various aspects that can be useful. So if you are interested, please join that particular uh, hybrid uh, mode, uh, uh, you know, uh, brainstorming session. Okay. Panel discussion. Okay, so I will share that flyer in our uh, WhatsApp yeah, group. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I, saw, I saw the same flyer, but uh, you'd better share, share it. Okay, sir. Okay, then. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank Good you, night. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.